The movie starts at the annual United Nations Global Warming Conference in New Delhi, where paleoclimatologist Jack Hall is giving a speech. He warns the delegates that the Earth is soon going to face a polar catastrophe, which will turn everything into ice. When some of the delegates inquire about the time left, Jack mentions that it may take some centuries. But if the usage of fossil fuel isn't lessened, their own grandchildren will face the consequences. After the conference, Jack meets a representative from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, Terry Rapson, and the duo begin chatting about their respective findings. As they discuss, it snows heavily, implying that climate change has already begun. Or maybe it's just winter. Over the course of the next few weeks, strange weather conditions strike different parts of the world. In Japan, monstrous blocks of hailstones start falling from the sky, leaving several people dead. Such hailstones are the largest that have ever been recorded in history. Meanwhile, at Terry Rapson's monitoring station in Scotland, the computers reveal that parts of the ocean are suffering massive drops in temperature. The drops are so sudden and mysterious that the communication signals placed there have frozen instantly. Elsewhere, at the International Space Station, astronauts notice gigantic storms brewing up in the Earth's troposphere. In the next scene, we are taken to Washington, D.C., where Jack is dropping his son, Sam, at the airport. Sam is a genius student who has been invited to participate in a decathlon in New York. Though his father is a well-known man, Sam appears to be angry with him, as Jack has always been absent from his life due to his busy work schedule. Nonetheless, he assures Sam that once he retires, he will have all the time in the world for his family, unless they're all dead. Later, when Sam, along with his best friends Laura and Brian, arrive at New York, they notice a large flock of birds flying towards the west, as if they are trying to escape something. In the meantime, Terry calls Jack from his monitoring station and informs him about his findings. He says that the polar catastrophe is approaching them rapidly and that they have no time to escape it. When Jack inquires if it is bad, Terry replies that something like this hasn't happened in the last 10,000 years. Following this, we are taken to a weather monitoring center in California where a technician is enjoying his time with his girlfriend. Just then, he receives a distress call from a man who reveals that it is raining hailstones in LA. Hearing this, the technician turns on the television and is taken aback to see that hailstones the size of golf balls have ravaged parts of the city. He immediately calls his boss and tells him to issue a tornado warning in the state of California. However, it's too late. In no time, several gigantic tornadoes circle the city and destroy everything in sight. Must have been one hell of a gender reveal party. Because of this, an emergency meeting is conducted at the Office of Global Change in Washington, D.C. One of the attendees mentions the other destructive weather occurrences in different parts of the world and asserts that some Something has gone wrong. Just then, Jack, who is also among the attendees, reveals to the crowd that everything is happening due to the North Atlantic currents. The currents are brought upon by the rapidly melting polar ice, which in turn is caused by global warming. He also mentions that it is just the beginning, and in a few days, the weather will become worse. In the next scene, Jack meets with the vice president and tries to make him understand that the situation is very critical. He mentions that the polar blast could hit any time, so mass evacuations in the northern states are necessary. However, the VP is an idiot, doesn't take him seriously, and walks away. Elsewhere in the UK, it has started snowing at a rapid rate, so three helicopters are sent to the royal palace to retrieve the queen. However, on their way, they pass through the eye of the storm, which causes their instruments to freeze instantly. In no time, the chopper blades also stop working, and all the three helicopters crash to the ground. One pilot manages to survive the crash, but as soon as he opens the door, he is frozen to death. Back to Manhattan, Sam and his friends try to get back to D.C., but all the transport services have been derailed by the heavy downpour. Desperate to get out of the city, the trio walk to the streets, only to find the city in utter chaos. Just then, a massive tsunami appears out of nowhere and begins sweeping the place. The skyscrapers and even the Statue of Liberty is engulfed, as if they are nothing. Sam and his group see the impending danger and rush to the National Library Hall for safety. Sadly, thousands of not-so-lucky people are washed away and killed. Later, Terry calls Jack and informs him about the freezing air over Europe, which brought down the helicopters. This alarms Jack, and after a bit of research, he finds out that the storm is approaching the U.S. sooner than expected. In fact, they only have 48 hours before everything freezes over. Following this, he opens the weather prediction, which shows that three colossal weather systems are forming in different parts of the world. They are getting larger by the day, and in Europe, the polar state has already begun. Meanwhile, Sam desperately searches for a telephone 
phone in the library, as the place does not have any mobile phone reception. After a while, he descends to another floor and finds a telephone, which is almost submerged in the water. Desperate to call his parents, he swims to the place and finally makes a call. Jack is delighted to find that his son is alive and starts giving him instructions. Put on some water wingies and don't die, son. He tells Sam that he must stay indoors and wait for the storm to pass. If he ventures outside, he is going to freeze to death instantly. Hearing this, Sam becomes worried, but Jack consoles him by saying that he will come to rescue him soon. The next day, as everyone in the library is gathering clothes and rations, they hear a strange noise from outside. When they peek through the window, they are shocked to see a cargo ship sailing through the place. Elsewhere in DC, the head of the state is having a meeting, and Jack is tasked with briefing the state of the situation. Before even beginning, he instills fear in everyone by mentioning that the worst is yet to come. He then suggests that the residents of the southern states must be evacuated immediately and moved to Mexico. Once again, the vice president disapproves of the idea, as he claims that an evacuation of such magnitude is not possible. At least he didn't build a stupid-ass wall. He also asks what will happen to the residents of the north, to which Jack replies that it's too late for them. If they step out of their homes, they will immediately freeze to death. The best they can do is stay inside their houses and wait for the storm to subside. Surprisingly, the president takes Jack's advice and orders the National Guard to evacuate the remaining population to the south. In New York, the people inside the library see a group of people walking on the frozen land and deduce that they are heading to the warmer states. As a result, they also decide to venture outside before the snow gets any deeper. Sam, knowing about the impending danger, tries to warn everyone that it's a death mission, but he is completely ignored. Soon, everyone leaves the library, with the exception of Sam's group and a few other people. Meanwhile, Jack starts his trip to New York, along with his colleagues and best buddies, Frank and Jason. Since the three have visited the Arctic several times for research purposes, they are accustomed to the weather. Back at the library, Sam and his group scan through the whole building for food and discover some vending machines. They also gather some books for burning in the fireplace. Elsewhere, as Jack and his crew are traveling through the thick snow, they suddenly hit a roadblock and are forced to continue their journey on foot. They walk for a few hours with utmost dedication, but unfortunately, when they reach the top of a fragile building, Frank breaks the glass and falls in. He is caught by the lifeline and the two friends are holding him up. But just then, the glass starts to crack. Hence, left with no choice, he cuts his lifeline and sacrifices himself so that his friends can continue their mission. At the library, Laura suddenly gets a fever and falls unconscious. Worried, the group starts searching for the cause and discovers that she has a wound in her leg, which might have caused her blood poisoning. One of the ladies in the group, who happens to be a medic, mentions that Laura needs an urgent injection of penicillin or else she will have to be amputated. Desperate to save his friend, because those legs go for days, Sam decides to venture into a nearby cargo ship, hoping that it contains some medicine. As he is about to leave, Brian and another guy, JD, also decide decide to accompany him. In the next scene, the VP, who is now stationed in a military base, finds out that the president met with an accident and died while being evacuated. To make matters worse, the researchers also find out that the eye of the storm has shifted its course to New York City. Elsewhere, Jack and Jason are slowly moving towards their destination, but sadly, Jason collapses due to exhaustion. As a result, Jack is forced to carry his friend. At the library, the trio finally heads out and makes their way to the cargo ship. However, However, along the way, their scent is caught by a pack of hungry wolves who have broken out from the nearby zoo. We just met JD, so he's dead for sure. Sam, Brian, and JD enter the cargo ship's kitchen and find some penicillin. They then look around the place for more supplies, but suddenly, they're attacked by the pack of wolves. Sam and Brian manage to escape to another room, <laughs> but JD is severely bitten, I knew it. Still, they manage to save him from the hungry beasts. As the three brainstorm different ideas to escape the situation, Sam looks outside and sees the skies clearing. He then realizes that the eye of the storm is nearing them and that they don't have enough time left. Hence, he puts himself in harm's way and makes his way outside to lure the wolves away from the kitchen. He then runs through the abandoned ship, narrowly escaping the wolves. After a while, he catches up with his friends, but by this time, JD is unable to stand. Hence, Sam and Brian bring a sledge and drag their friend to the library. On the other hand, as Jack is dragging Jason through the thick snow, he also notices the eye approaching at a rapid speed. Wasting no time, he starts rummaging through the snow for any houses. Fortunately, he finds an open vent and throws Jason inside before getting in himself. As soon as he closes the door, the frost attacks the place and freezes everything that it touches. 
The boys also reach the library just in time and narrowly avoid death. They then scramble to keep the fire running, as it is the only thing that can save them from the brutal cold. Jack also desperately tries to light a fire and manages to do so with an open stove. After a while, Jason wakes up and notices that the entire place has been covered with ice. Now, with the eye of the storm already gone, Jack plans to resume his mission. Jason tries to make him understand that it's still dangerous outside, but Jack asserts that he doesn't have any time left. That night, the two sleep in a tent and contemplate the future of humanity. Jack mentions that humans have survived ice ages many times, but if they are not careful enough, they might go extinct in this one. Finally, after weeks of disastrous weather conditions, the International Space Station spots some good signs. They notice that the storm is dissipating in Europe, as they see landmass for the first time in several weeks. At the same time, Jack also gets out of the tent and sees that the skies have cleared. The sun has also come out. After walking for a while, the two come across the frozen Statue of Liberty and several ships which have sunk into the ice. They have finally reached Manhattan after enduring days of excruciating pain and suffering. However, when they reach the exact location of the library, with the help of a GPS, they are devastated to learn that it has been completely swallowed by ice. With all hope now gone, the two prepare to leave, but just then, they notice a small opening in the snow. Wasting no time, Jack enters the library through the opening, and Jason follows him closely. The two then begin looking for Sam, and fortunately, after a bit of looking around, find him. It turns out that Sam and his group are still alive because of the fire. With this, the father-son duo finally meet meet after weeks of separation amidst the terrifying weather conditions. Following this, the scene cuts to Mexico, where the new president is informed that there are survivors in New York. The news excites him, and he announces live on television that he will be initiating a major rescue operation to retrieve anyone who is stranded in the northern states. In the final scene of the movie, the choppers reach Manhattan, where several people are found to be alive. They have gathered on the rooftops, waiting to be rescued. The helicopters also reach Jack and his group, who are finally taken to the south. The movie ends as an astronaut from the International Space Station gazes at the Earth and remarks that it is the clearest sky that he has ever seen. He also says, I can see Bezos' rocket from here.